Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today we're with a, we're with a very special guest. I uh, I grew up seeing this man's art th- work all throughout Seattle, up into Bellingham and near Mount Rainier. I used to go skiing at Crystal Mountain, and I'd see it in little gift shops there. Um, I'm I'm probably one of the biggest Henry fans in Seattle, in, in my opinion. I mm-hmm. don't have a, a car that's wrapped in Henry artwork. I will say that. But um, I believe that this man's artwork is very pivotal in making Seattle's culture what it is. And um, this is a bucket bucket list interview for me, so I'm very stoked for you to be here. Thanks a lot. Ryan Henry Ward or just Henry. Yeah, thank you. So let's start from the the very, very beginning. You were born in Montana. I was. Am I correct? Yes. For 10 years you lived there. Yep. So what was your childhood like? Um, I was, well, I was raised by teenagers pretty much so Mm. they um my parents had kids had my older brother when they were still in high school and me the year after so um and then my younger brother five years later but they were uh teenagers raising babies um and i lived i grew up in my great grand a house that my great grandfather built Mm. and it was a small farm and um my dad was a welder and my mom was a waitress and we had like a small functioning farm for growing vegetables and stuff like that. Um, I'd say we were, uh, mostly like lower income childhood, but, uh, um, I didn't really realize that till I started going to school and was, didn't have the cool clothes or whatever, Mm. you know? Um, so the first early childhood and it was just kind of, um, a lot of creativity. Um, we didn't have very many toys, so we had to make our own toys and, um, uh, and also just like Halloween costumes, anything like that. We kind of had to create our own. And, uh, um, so there was a lot of, um, being lower income, there was a lot of like good stuff of, uh, creative and, you know, creativity, um, inspiration from my parents and stuff like that and they're just like just make something make right. something make something and so just from early childhood we were always making stuff um and i think that that just kind of like ca- has carried the ruin to my life that's awesome yeah. I, I i keep reiterating on the podcast like podcasting specifically even if i had known about podcasting when i was a younger kid or i would be now even you know what i mean just it's right. it's those, those little things when you like keep being told you can do this you can do this right. even even if it's a hobby that sticks in your mind those yeah. are the things that you uh I I believe in you can make your when I when I first started my podcast people would be like that's a nice dream of yours right and I'm like no it's it's a goal that's what I'm doing you know what I mean yeah. so like yeah I, I really feel like if um if you know creativity is like reinforced at a young age it doesn't have to be a dream it could be a right. goal and you can find ways to make a livable living right so you you i'm guessing so 10 years old you went through all of elementary school in montana yeah up till fourth grade and then I, we moved to yakima kent and then by sixth grade ended up in enumclaw wow yeah so there was like a few years of movement around there and i was super excited like when i left montana we moved into town mm-hmm. and all I cared about was candy and I'd go to like my friend's houses who lived in town and cause I lived way out in the country. So I went to town and you could find like, you know, a couple dimes on the ground and go to the candy store and buy some sour patch kids or something like that. And I loved that. And mm. so when I moved out of Montana, I was super stoked because I was like, I have access to candy <laughs> um, and I can find quarters and get candy or whatever. And, um, uh, so I remember like my best friend being all, you know, really crying and sad that I was leaving. And I was like, dude, I'm, I get to go to can Like I get candy now. <laughs> You've always had candy. And I, you know, you don't understand like access to like stores and stuff was like a big deal. So I, at 10, that was like my priority was like the candy hookup. So <laughs> damn, that's, yeah. that's super funny. You found the yellow brick road or yeah. something. Basically. I still like candy. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a huge sweet tooth. Yeah. 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 That I God. Yeah. I, I, 
I love ice cream. Yeah. I love like anything peppermint. That's right. that's my go to. <laughs> that's thing. awesome. What what is are you like sour patch? You brought up sour patch kids. Is that like your I go? S- I still like them. I'm more into the chocolates now. Okay, you know I like chocolate candy. Yeah. I think Reese's is really like blown up. They've expanded their candy like. Um, candy world it used to just be the Reese's cups and Reese's pieces now there's like 20 options or something and there's like white chocolate flavor yeah. they got the Christmas treats see we could just have a whole yeah. candy podcast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's wild because um, for, for, people, for people who don't know Yakima to Kent to Enumclaw those are <laughs> so far apart they are, in, yeah. in, in Washington yeah and it was like all about making new friends and Losing friends and making friends again and losing friends and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so I guess it makes, I guess it would be like a full circle moment for your art to be in Enumclaw ish area because yeah. I forget where's that town. So I have a. <clears throat> like out fam- of Greenwater, maybe? Yes, yeah. yes. My family has a cabin in Greenwater. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so I've seen the the um, stickers and stuff there. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, Henry. Yeah. I got the postcards. So, but we'll, we'll get into like how you became. Henry, you are today. Um, so you finished schooling, I'm guessing, in high school in yeah, I finished in Enumclaw. Enumclaw. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to art school. Am I correct? No, I went to community college. Okay. Yeah, and it took me like four years or something to get through community college, okay. and because I just kind of worked and paid my way, and then um, went to Fairhaven College, which is up in Bellingham part of Western and I took a few art classes, but not too many mm. took some printmaking and um, a life drawing class, but it wasn't my main focus. Got it. Yeah. It's what's really cool about uh, your art is like, it's like your art is how I think of a movie actor where I'm like, Brad Pitt would be great in this movie. And then like in the third act, Brad Pitt walks in and you're like, oh shit, Brad Pitt is here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like That's awesome. I was, uh, I forget where I was. I was in this place in Bellingham and I'm like, if Henry's heart was here, that would be so cool. And I turn the corner and I'm like, oh shit, it yes. is here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, it's, I'm always super excited to see your, see your art. Um, so what, what were your goals once you like were living in Washington and you started going to college, like, were you trying to be an artist or what were you going to school for at the time? Um, no, I was, uh, I eventually I got into, um, I, I did want to be an artist, but I didn't really know how that was going to play out because mm-hmm. I wasn't interested in the art world. I wasn't interested in like the fine art world, the galleries and museum scenes and the, the, um, with critics and the whole the whole thing I just wasn't like wanting to play that game mm-hmm. um and so I was tr- thinking I was going to be a children's book illustrator mm. and writer so my main focus in college was creative writing and then I'd already kind of my art was already pretty well developed by the time I was in college um that I didn't want to focus on it much or have it like really messed around with right. um and uh so and i and i was just always making art so it wasn't like something i felt like i needed instruction with um the creative writing i felt like i needed more help with and then i also took some theater classes so if i ever did publish a book i could present it present it and read it and feel comfortable with that yeah um and then i didn't really go down that road um i ended up getting into murals and doing more of the fine art world that I was scared of. But. Wait, so you've never, you don't have a single, I feel like you have, you don't have a, a single child, children's no, book? No, I do. Okay. I've, I've illustrated some children's books and then I've um, written and illustrated uh, A Squirrel's Guide to Happiness and Mystic Hug Thug and now I have just a book of paintings called Now. Okay. Yeah. Would and that be so, like a coffee table book? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just all all artwork in that one. That's dope. So, so for people who don't know, I, I should I should definitely like pull some pictures up on the podcast just so people see what we're, we're talking about here. Um, so when did these any of these type of characters come to fruition? Like, is that something from a childhood age, or <coughs> is, did these, some of these characters in this style come later on in life? Um, some of them came through childhood. I was really into stuffed animals as a kid, mm. so um, I was. Um, like I was saying, I didn't have a lot of toys like that other kids had. I didn't have like a G.I. Joe collection. I didn't have the He-Man stuff. I didn't have the Star Wars toys. My parents were kind of anti 
violence mm. and didn't want me to have any play war stuff. Uh, it didn't stop us from playing war. We just did it with like BB guns and yeah. mouse traps, throwing mouse traps. <laughs> I think it was more dangerous that they didn't get us the toys, <laughs> man. Like we're lucky to have survived childhood, <laughs> really. <laughs> Whapping each other with like real sticks. It's like, just give them a toy. It won't do that. But um <laughs> Damn. yeah so you can't like you can't really stop the nature of a human but mm -hmm. um uh yeah so i had a big collection of stuffed animals and i was really into them and kind of beyond the age that most kids are um i just loved my stuffed animals and as i started painting um uh, a lot of those characters kind of like i had this stuffed animal elephant and it became this character i started painting a lot Mm. And a lot of the characters I kind of was working on um, in my 20s um, when I was really getting into painting, I was kind of drawing from those like personalities of those characters that I had developed from childhood. Mm. So they all had like um, already developed personalities and stuff like that. And I was just like beginning to paint them kind of in my um, late teens, early 20s. And did, were you like inspired by any artists at that time? Like did you even like read comic books or anything like that? Um I wasn't really into comic books. I was into, um, I read like, uh, I, I was pretty sheltered from art. Got it. Um, so I had access to Saturday morning cartoons, um, and, uh, Sunday morning comic strips. And mm -hmm. that was pretty much it. So you got Garfield uh, and, at least. And, yeah. <laughs> and children's books. So yeah. these are like my three things I had access to. Um, yeah, I had Garfield. Yeah. Um, it was hilarious. Um, but I think like when I was in, I was in third grade, I started, I had like my own comic strip that I started mm. and that went on through high school and it kind of, it changed. It was, um, so in like third grade to, I can't remember fifth grade or something. There was, uh, Mr. Pibb and his dog Ernie was the cartoon strip and the, um, his dog was an alligator mm. and Mr. Pibb was this blind guy who thought he had a dog but he had a pet alligator and it would just eat everything you know? <laughs> and he didn't know you know that was kind of the premise and it was like really third fourth grade humor you know that's pretty great though yeah. that's pretty imaginative yeah and then I started the cheese life which was another comic strip really inspired by the far side okay so it was probably like trying to copy that single frame cartoon style of gary larson mm. who's a seattle guy too um but that was probably my biggest inspiration and then there was uh calvin and Hobbes and yeah. um herman by jim unger his illustrative style was really influential and uh i really was studying Calvin and Hobbes expressions so like face expressions and body expressions and stuff like that I was really like looking at that and because I loved it and I wanted to like emulate that um and at a really young age my grandfather told me to not copy people but to come up with my own style so right. I would like I wasn't trying to copy Calvin and Hobbes I was just trying to figure out what he was doing with mm -hmm. like um body movements and stuff like that what is that so you're more it seems like you're more drawn to like drawing like animals how did that get, come into play um i think that might be from rooted from like the the early stuffed animal stuff because i was using those things as as like painting tools kind of like mm -hmm. i wanted to teach myself how to paint so i would just take the idea of the elephant and paint it like a hundred different ways mm -hmm. you know and that so there's like i was just painting elephants for a while and then i was just painting um bunny rabbits and, and then i was just painting goats and these were all kind of like characters from uh from early childhood i was just using their structure to kind of learn how to paint and at this point do you have like a name for every type of character you draw like are there species or i still specific just names for i them? still just keep it pretty generic mm. yeah like um squirrels just the squirrel and sasquatch is sasquatch um so most things generally have just a common name got it yeah do you think are any of them abstract enough that they're like your own type of creature would you say there's quite a few of those got yeah it. and i don't i don't really i'm not really into naming things for some reason mm. i'm not sure why what about like uh, a car? Have you have you ever named a car? 
Um, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've named my own cars. Yeah. Um, uh, my van is named Steve. <laughs> sure and, well, that was from my, my hanging out with my niece and we were like driving around and she said something else. And I heard Steve, like, we're like, we should name this car. And then I thought she said, Steve, she said something else. And then I was like, well, its name is Steve. And then we just thought it was hilarious, was like to give it a human name, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I had a pickup truck called the Dark Cloud, and uh, I have a new car. I don't know what to name it yet. Okay. But, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I, I have never had luck with naming cars. Yeah. Because it's, it's supposed to come to you, you yeah. know what I mean? So I'm I'm hoping it's going to be like some romantic thing one day. I'm just like driving, the sun set in, and then just pops in my head. What kind of, what kind of car is it? So- my car right now, it's it's a reliable car, pretty yeah. basic. It's like a Ford Fusion, okay. right? A 2014 Ford Fusion, pretty sleek. The funny, the backstory for the car is super, it's it's dark humor and kind of sad, but I think it's funny. <laughs> so basically, my first car I got was uh, Acura Integra GS. Okay. And um, got it from a car collector. Yeah. He had 10 cars. His wife's like, you got to get rid of a car. Right. So- Sold it for to me for like three thousand bucks, nice. like crazy deal, yeah. low miles. Awesome. Um, but it was old enough that I didn't know at the time that you had to check your own oil. Okay. So I ran out of oil, messed up the alternator, like it was a whole thing, yeah. right? Ended up messing up the catalytic converter as well. Died on the, on the freeway, almost got hit by a semi truck, and I was Damn. like, okay, it's time to get a new car. Yeah. Right. So. And I'm I'm the best at Facebook Marketplace or yeah. OfferUp or Craigslist. So um, I borrowed my grandma's car for about two to three months. Okay. And this time frame is starting to inch into early 2020. Right. right? Okay. So then um, March 2020 happens, and the very beginning. So nothing's ha- nothing's happened yet. Yeah. Right. So I I find the car. Actually, I bought the car down the street from here so i bought oh, it on really? the app nice super oh, funny crazy so this uh this this guy um was just graduating from uw and moving back to wuhan right before covid started oh wow i bought the car That's crazy and we were starting to hear things about you know covid yeah. and i planned like a week-long trip and I got back the day of the lockdown. Yeah. And that was my first experience with my car. Oh my God. You know what I mean? So I feel like I have I have sent sentiment with this car. I just have, yeah. don't have a name for it right. yet. And it's yeah. been well, that's been like two years now. Yeah. So but yeah, that was crazy. This guy started moved back to one. I was like, oh my gosh. Um but yeah, I am not the best at naming things you can either. Name it pan or something. Yeah. From pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, that could be good. Hundred percent. Pan's labyrinth. Ooh, see, yeah, I call him labyrinth. Have you uh, have something. you checked out the new uh, Pinocchio movie by what's his name? I've been watching it. It's pretty dope, yeah. man. Yeah, I just watched like probably forty five minutes of it or something. It's dark. Yeah, I like it's it. Super dark. crazy. Yeah. yeah, he's on a. Oh, I forgot what is his name. Guillermo, Guillermo, whatever the yeah, director's name is. Yeah, Del Toro. Yeah, I'm just gonna go with Del Toro. Yeah. Um, he's been on a crazy run. His uh. Like two months ago, they released like a mini series on Netflix, and now oh, you have cool. this Pinocchio. You should watch nice. that. I will. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. But yeah, Pan's Labyrinth. Do you get any like inspiration from that at all? Yeah, I a lot of my work has those elements in it. Yeah, mm. very. Um, uh, uh, a friend of mine just get, uh, said folk magic was like a good term mm. for my artwork. I draw. I do a lot of like. Um, I do a lot of creatures from like uh, like satyrs and things like that, um, and just magical uh, um, uh, things more from like uh, kind of more old world stuff, Got old it. world mythology. Um, for some reason, that stuff just wants to come out of me. Mm. You know, um, unicorns and sasquatches and gnomes and. Um, uh, yeah, mythological creatures from all different um, uh, mythologies. Would you say kind of like? Would you say it's more like? Would you say any of your like designs are ominous though, or would you say they're more like uplifting most of the time, or uh, happy go lucky? There's definitely a um, my my 
canvas work it goes all range yeah Got there's it. like um super dark stuff to um uh yeah i would say there's a lot of skulls and a lot of like indications of um death and stuff like that that i mm. i paint um i have a lot of feelings about death and so i want to like express them and talk about them a little bit with my work and um yeah there's some of my work has some violence in it and um uh, some of it has sexuality and um so there's i i think i'm expressing the full human range hell yeah yeah and my mural work tends to be i have a philosophy around my mural work um publicly which is um i'm trying to paint for the public and in, include all ages mm -hmm. so i want to paint things that a five-year-old will like a teenager will like uh a, adults and elderly will all like be able to look at it and draw something from it and not leave out um anybody because of their age or education level fair enough you know like, would, would you say is the mascot i mean is your mascot the sasquatch would you say it's or? kind of become that okay yeah but that's not how it started no yeah it didn't start that way that kind of came a little bit that happened around 2000 i started painting the sasquatch i think in 2010 um and then I think by 2012, he was in a couple murals and then Sasquatch Music Festival hit me up and they had me do their um, ground, the art on the grounds for like six years. And so wow. it really pushed that character and um, and it pushed it into the consciousness of uh, Washington. And then everybody wanted the Sasquatch in a mural, you know, mm. and then. So it's become this like main. I, th I would say it's my main character because of that. Damn. Yeah. I I love your uh, Sasquatch and Flastic Pub. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I, like oh, so I think it's in your your works in like every Flastic Pub. I just finished their sixth one in Redmond. Whoa. Yeah, and three of the six have sculptures. So uh, wow. uh, South Lake Union, Spokane, and now Redmond all have sculptures. Damn. Um, yeah, I just finished like a week and a half ago. I finished Redmond Project, so that'll be opening pretty soon. And does it, my body still hurts from <laughs> it. And actually, I had to shave my arms because I had so much uh, adhesives and things that I, from sculpting stuck in my arm hair that I just shaved it off. And I was like, that's kind of weird. But wow. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. So, like, did you get any inspiration from sculpting from, like, your, you said your dad was a welder? Yeah. So, like, does yeah. that, like, does that handiwork come from any of your childhood at all? Or I, th well, I just think seeing things three-dimensional is kind of natural for me because we were just building stuff with cardboard boxes a lot as kids. Um, Got it. You know, um, we used to build skateboard ramps a lot. Um, we were really into skateboarding, uh, me and my brothers. And we would just collect old wood, used wood. We'd build little launch ramps, half pipes, quarter pipes. And this was before, like, skate parks were a thing. Mm -hmm. There was, like, two skate parks in the state of Washington. There was an indoor one in Yakima. And then there was one out. No, this one, the other one was in, I think that was the only one in Washington. And then there was one in Oregon um, by uh, Seaside, Oregon, had, mm. had a um, skate park. And um, so we just had to build all our own stuff. And um, so all of our friends had skateboard ramps and me and my brother were building that stuff. And then we'd also build like mini ones with for like fingerboard skate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were way into Tech that deck too. type things. Yeah, so we like just out of cardboard and all this stuff. So we were always like, um, constructing and building things. Mm. And, um, uh, I, I think my dad had a big imagination and, um, he has invented a few things and, um, uh, he was kind of an inventor and, uh, um, a storyteller and stuff too. So he was, um, and, and he still, um, work, he works for, with me now full time. What? Yeah. He's, he runs all my merchandise and stuff. Like ah, that. so, that's sick. Yeah, yeah. He's captain of my merchandise basically. So, wow. Yeah. He makes all my t-shirts and prints and mails them out to everybody and stuff. So dang. So what, what's that yeah. like having like a, 
a parent that's not too far off in age from me? Like, does that mean you guys are kind of like best friends at this point or what is that like? Yeah. Yeah. I would say I'm close. I'm super close with both my parents um, in, awesome. di in different ways. They're completely different people from each other. Mm. They're still married. Wow. They've been together since, I mean, they started dating when my mom was a freshman in high school and my dad <sighs> was a sophomore. So they've been together a while, you Dang. know? Um, and they're yeah they're really different from each other and then but they have a lot in common too they're both like just very sincere honest people um and how they present that's a little different but mm. um yeah my mom has less of a filter and just tells you what's on her mind no matter what and then my dad is a little quieter and um uh, uh still lets you know what's up right you know but um yeah i'm super close with them we have a lot in common Hell yeah. Yeah. And are, are your siblings creative at all? Um, my older sibling, uh, he died um, oh, wow. when he was 25 and I was 24. Whoa. And he was super creative, musician, played um, trumpet and guitar and, and quite a few different bands over the years, um, uh, lead singer in a few bands. Um, uh, and a very visual artist and taught me a lot about visual arts as well. Um, mm. And then uh, my younger brother is uh, very creative and especially in the way he like uh, is a f family dad. He has like three, three kids and um, just kind of pours everything into them, you know? Mm. So um, yeah, he kind of like, his whole thing is them, so. Interesting. Yeah. And do you have do you have kids at all? I don't. Never been married. Never yeah, had wow. Kids. Yeah. That kind of what is that like being like a full time artist? Is that kind of like do you feel like you get like tunnel vision still? It doesn't allow me much time for those kind of things, and yeah. I see for I see friends that do those things, and it just kind of takes away time. Um, and I'm so obsessed with my work that and kind of feel married to it that mm. um, I try dating and um, it tends to not work out because it's like I'm not available. It's like, yeah. you know, and I want to be and then but the reality of it is, is always kind of a struggle. That's kind of how it is, though, yeah. to yeah. be honest. Yeah. So I don't even know how to phrase because you've been doing art for a while. So I don't know how you would say you got your start as Henry though would you say you got your start when you got your first paycheck as Henry or would you say you got your start when you made your first mural or whatever I think for me it was like a real big it was a real clear decision to become a professional artist okay and um I had like gone through some physical injury stuff and ended up uh deciding that I needed to um, create a career that I could work with, with like kind of a busted up back a little bit. Um, and so I was like, okay, now I'm going to start my art. And when I made that decision, I knew that, uh, I was going to move into a vehicle. And mm. so I got like a, I got a truck off of Craigslist for like $300 or something like that and barely ran. And then mm. a friend gave me a camper and I basically put the two things together, had a friend help me put the lights, hook the lights up for the camper had lights. And then I just drove it into um, uh, pretty close to like Gasworks Park and parked it. And that was my house. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I got my art into a gallery in, um, in Fremont and kind of all kind of simultaneously like working on getting the vehicle together and the artwork together. I think I put like 12 paintings together um, and had an art show at a gallery. And I sold a couple pieces for like 700 bucks. And then um, I made pretty good money on my first art show, like somehow. And then uh, I just kept taking that money and reinvesting it into my art. Mm. And so, I, and then about six months after that, I started doing murals and um, publicly in Seattle. And then they just kind of took off. Wait, so how did, 
how why would an art gallery accept you? You weren't you were just like an artist off the street type. Yeah, I was just out. I had my I basically put twelve paintings together, photographed them, put a little portfolio together, and was just going around everywhere. Wow. And then I just found the right fit. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it was the Orange Splot Gallery in Fremont and um, the dude liked my stuff and he was the first guy to like it. Hmm. You know, there I got turned down all over town and this dude, Kevin McEwen, who owned the gallery was like, I love it. I'm going to give you a show. And what year was this? Would you say? 2008. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, February, 2008, I had my first show in Seattle. Dang. Um, and I'd done some coffee shop shows in Bellingham and things like that. And I kind of knew that it would do okay. Got it. Um, but he just was like, yeah, let's give it a go. And I had it. And then he, um, he kept me in that gallery for like 18 months. And so every month at art walk, we would have a thing there and it would, and I kept selling work. Hmm. And, um, so as long as I kept selling, he was like, you can stay in here. And then eventually the recession kind of hit and like kind of took him, took the gallery down. And then after that, I got into a coffee shop in Fremont Ballard area and um, the guy who owned it is named Garrett and he let me show my art in there for like eight years. So if anyone wanted an original painting, they could go there and get one right off the wall. What is, what does a recession do to physical art? Does that like make the value go down at all? Well, it just, I, it kind of just took everybody out. Like it was like, it was a big recession and it just kind of like everyone kind of ate it. Um, but I survived it, you Mm. know, a lot of artists didn't, but like, I just started making art for more art for less money. Kind of like I was making smaller pieces and I was doing like 10 paintings a day and I would just sell them for whatever, you know, after, mm. after that gallery closed. Um, and how I did so well in that first gallery is I allowed the, um, gallery owner to price it. Mm. And I said, I want to sell two paintings a week out of here. And like you price them to make that happen. And so he did. And I was like the only artist in there doing that. Everyone else wanted to keep and be attached to their own pricing. And I, I was just like, you're in here, you know, people, so, and I want to sell two a week, so whatever, you know, and they were like $226. He had all weird prices, mm-hmm. but it worked. And it like, he was selling, you know, quite a few pieces of mine out of there every week. Mm. So, um, I, I think I just think outside of the box. I'm not attached to money. I think that helps. Um, I, uh, I mean, I like making money, but I'm not like, um, it's not necessarily a thing that drives me. Right. As much as I think other people, a lot of people get caught up in it and it slows them down. It's a stuck point, I think, for a lot of artists. But. So in that first gallery, was it still like the similar styles to what we see today with your art? Yeah, there might have been a little bit more like sexuality in the stuff. Like there was like just more body parts and stuff. And then I started doing like paintings for grade schools and people would come to the gallery with grade school people and they would be like, I didn't want my kid to see that, you know, (laughs) I'm like, well, it's an art gallery, you know, like don't bring them to Europe, you know, like, (laughs) I don't know, like that's pretty normal for the art world, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But then I just started thinking more, I I think I just kind of lost interest in, I still paint those kind of things, but I don't need them on display, you know, for everyone to see. So there's, I got a big enough uh, interest audience in that, that they, can get a hold of me personally and see that kind of stuff got it so like yeah. when you before right before the gallery were you like part of any collective or anything or were you just solely just doing this all by your own or do you have any like people telling you if you want to do art maybe this is how you do it you get th- that book together you shop around or how did that come to be i just did it all on my own wow yeah i was just like yeah every every step of the way has been um figuring out how to do it on my own um, even now, like I run, I have big shows and I, I rent the venue. I hire the people that run the cash registers and the whole thing. Mm. And I just produce, like I produce my own shows without, um, you know, uh, 
I, I, I guess I still just try to do it my own way, mm -hmm. you know, mostly because I don't want to give like huge cuts to right. people, you know, it's Fair like enough. everyone wants like, <laughs> everyone wants 50% and it's like, I don't know, I did more work than, right. you know, like if, and I've had a lot of gallery shows where I've made that agreement. Okay. You get 50% and I get 50%. And then I see a lot of times them not putting what I feel is equivalent energy and advertising for my artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and if I saw more of that from a gallery, it would be worth it. Like if I was selling twice as much mm -hmm. because they were advertising well, then they would deserve 50%. But I've just, every time I get involved, it's, they're not pushing as much and they are taking a big cut. So like, and that might change. So there might be like a gallery someday that, um, can represent me and take me on but at this point i pretty much can just do it myself got it yeah so that's that's interesting to hear that you start out on like canvas versus murals because mm -hmm. i feel like me included and maybe it's true i feel like people think you got your start as like a graffiti artist or right. something yeah and d i'm guessing you didn't or i did not yeah mm. i wasn't a graffiti artist um it wasn't really part of my uh, it, w it wasn't like an option in my subculture growing up as a kid, like, uh, growing up in Enumclaw, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't appealing. I mean, I think like in, like if I would have been raised in Seattle, it would be different because the skateboarding and graffiti culture are very closely related. Mm -hmm. But in Enumclaw, the skateboarding culture had nothing to do with graffiti. Right. Um, it was kind of a different, uh. A different vibe about it or something like that and we didn't really even think about it mm -hmm. you know we were getting just in trouble for vandalizing with our skateboards and that was enough and there were so many cops for such a little area that like yeah we just we didn't even think about doing it you right. know and so by the time i got older i i was doing street art stuff as a teenager I kind of got into wheat pasting and What's I just kind of took pasting? a, took a little different angle, like I, or I would see something and I would enhance it and like, add like that looks like this. And I would kind of add a mm. couple little things to make it, um, make it into something. Um, I'd say my late twenties, I was more into just, yeah, like, um, get starting to get into a little bit of graffiti and stuff like that but i was definitely thinking different than most graffiti artists got it you know i wasn't thinking about just putting like a name up or something like that i was kind of like putting cartoons up in bathrooms and things mm -hmm. like that um do you yeah. get asked a lot if you're if you were a graffiti artist i do yeah interesting because yeah. i mean i paint with spray paint now all the time right um so yeah it um I think people just naturally make the connection that way. But, wow. Yeah. So has your so I'm guessing your materials of choice have changed throughout they the have. years as well? Yeah, for sure. Wow. Yeah, spray paint. All my early murals were just house paint. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, spray paint kind of started taking over probably 2012. So it's probably been about 10 years that I've been doing my outdoor work with spray paint. Like the first four wow. or five years didn't have that. That's yeah. like your, most of your murals outside are spray paint. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Just solely spray paint too. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. So do you have like a, do you have like a spray paint connect that you go to, to I, get stuff from? Well, or? I'm kind of, I think on some people's lists just cause I buy so much at a time. Mm -hmm. So if like a store's closing down or, one of my friends just has overstock. They'll hit me up and I'll just buy like, you know, um, like I just bought 500 cans from somebody. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's, it's worth it. I save a couple bucks a can that adds up, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Damn. So yeah, I'll get, I'll get hit up. Hey, I got all this paint. You want it? And uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> usually I buy it, you know. And you've always been like, into like a lot of different colors mm -hmm. or has your palette has your palette changed at all throughout the years as well um i'm into bright colors mm -hmm. i'm uh partially colorblind like i've Whoa. red green colorblind so i think i see things better when they're brighter okay and uh i actually had like those 
um, I got those colorblind correction glasses and I went and looked at all my artwork after I put those on and was like, <laughs> oh my God, I've really been, these are bright, you know, like that's kind of crazy. Um, so, but I don't like wearing those, but I just, I, I went and toured my murals with them on going, holy smoly. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. Really laying it on thick there with some bright colors. Do you think, why do you think brightness kind of like associates with like happiness usually versus like my, like my favorite era of, uh, music is like Motown you yeah know? and those are some of the saddest songs you'll hear but it's like all yeah. upbeat and stuff so I yeah, feel yeah. like maybe that can be the same correlation to like yeah. bright colors at times right. but yeah and I'm into um I'm into like the full range of feelings too mm -hmm. and like remember doing my first murals and everyone was saying they're so bright and fun and I'm like and happy and I'm like none of the face expressions on any of my characters have smiles mm -hmm. they're always like you know, um, uh, like half asleep eyes or like they look tired or like just kind of thoughtful. And it's the bright colors that people are associating with the happiness. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I, I, and if they were a different color palette, it would be like, oh, he's kind of a bummer. That's kind of, you know, that Walrush looks pretty sad actually. Right. So there's a lot of like, um, I think duality kind of or juxtaposition in my artwork with like bright colors and like the expressions aren't super bright, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I, I think that might be part of the intrigue and magic that most people don't really think about or see and they don't know why they like it. They think it's simple, but they like it enough because there's a lot of complexity going on on those, those kind of levels. You know, where it's going kind of full range with feelings with bright colors and sad expressions or like um, uh, bored looks or um, just like derpy, like, hmm? yeah, but yeah, like super bright. And it's like, you know, um, uh, I think it's like where you are and kind of where you want to be kind of at the same time. Fair enough. Yeah. So what was the decision with like most of your creatures have like the big eyes? Is it just... Yeah, so like, well, it's a really two dimensional, like a lot of my paintings are really kind of like side view, flat, two dimensional. And if you do one eye um, big and one eye small, it makes it look, gives it like a, a, a third dimension. Mm. So it makes it look like this one's closer, that one's further away, oh. and kind of forces your mind to see something that's really like a folk art flat design and pops it kind of um into a different dimension that makes and sense I, yeah i'm kind of like obsessed with like simplicity and getting these ideas in the simplest way to um mm. uh, make them work you know and this is kind of an out of the box question but this isn't like none of your creatures do they like represent people at all uh sometimes they do okay yeah like this, I have a tattoo on my arm that's like a walrus, and um, okay. that uh, is a representation of a time where I was going, my back injury got really flared up, and I had to stay in bed for a month. Mm. And so to get to the bed to the bathroom, I had to like crawl kind of with my arms and drag my body to the bathroom, mm -hmm. and I just felt like a walrus. Mm. And so I tattooed the walrus on myself. Um, and then- Well, you're after, a tattoo artist as well? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did like six tattoos. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did this one, and then it was it was when I was injured. I was living on a in a friend's house, like, and uh, um, a friend brought over a tattoo gun, because I couldn't get out of bed, and so they were like, oh, try this. and. Mm -hmm. People would come over and um, uh, I'd give tattoos and they were very uh, low skill level. Yeah, I didn't practice on things before. I just was just jumping in and giving tattoos. Mm. So there's about six of them out there that like um, uh, are on some people. <laughs> I feel, and I eternally apologize for ever giving any of them. When when the, you can sell that like 
if they're an organ donor, eventually you can sell that as an art gallery. Oh, yeah. Their arm or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Dang. Yeah. So I bet how many people like send you at least tattoos from another tattoo artist of like your characters on them? That's got to be a thing. Yeah, I'd say there might be around 100. Wow. Or something like. Someone was just asking. I was just starting to like do the numbers and was like, it's it's around 100 people have Henry tattoos mm. that other tattoo artists have done. And how does that make yeah. is that kind of weird when like another artist is like copying your I, art or how no, does that... I think it's cool. Okay. Yeah, I like the tattoo thing. People hit me up and like my main thing is like um like people will want me to design something and they want to know how much that is. I'm like, "Well, look through my catalog first cuz mm. if you find something you like, you can just use it for free, you know." Um, because the tattoo, getting the tattoo is going to cost you enough money. Right? <laughs> so like, I don't want to gouge people. Um, but if I have to do the work, then I charge them. Like if they want something spe specific, mm -hmm. um, this, uh, one person got, uh, a full sleeve and they used the design. Like I painted a mural in their house and they used that mural as their tattoo. So oh. They didn't have to like have it redesigned, you know. They just took a photo of it, brought it to oh, the wow. tattoo artist, and they applied it. You have murals so. in people's houses? Oh, a ton, yeah. What? A lot of indoor ones. Ah, uh, uh, a lot that's of private. Sick. Yeah, backyards, inside, all sorts of stuff. What? Some pretty crazy stuff. Like I've been in some like pretty crazy houses with epic views and stuff, and I'm like, man, this is awesome just being here you know and painting wow. um and did you ever think that was going to like happen i did you know like i remember being when i was starting i was living in a van or whatever or a camper and like someone buying art and me delivering it and i'm delivering i'm living in a vehicle and i'm delivering paintings to like multi-million dollar houses you know and helping them hang them and then i'm going back to bed in my you mm. know um you know, crawling in my sleeping bag and shivering myself to sleep, you know, going, you know, eventually I'll get there, you know. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm still not quite there. <laughs> but, like, um, I just knew that that was, like, I'm, I was, when I started as a professional artist, I was, like, do or die. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just going to do this, and I don't care. Like, I'm never going to do another job. And that's, like, I was, like, I'll starve to death before that happens. So I feel that. Yeah. What it's, is the like adamant? What's the shittiest job you've had? Oh my god. Um, I've done a lot of shitty things, man. <laughs> um, I you know just kind of growing up out in Enumclaw, there was a lot. I did a lot of odd like farm jobs that were super. Um, super hard digging digging ditches uh digging digging in the dirt's hard mm. you know um i put a lot of fence posts in i've done a lot of like um in the winter digging i'd say uh, just a memory comes to me where i was building a fence for somebody and it was snowing out and i'm digging in the ice the icy ground trying to get like fence posts mm. in and like mixing cement and getting snowed on and like um, trying to get the job done in a day and that kind of thing, like, um, that kind of thing kind of sucks. Mm. But I've also had some jobs I really enjoyed that most people might not. Like, I worked at Little Caesars Pizza for a few years and I really liked it. Yeah, you know, I liked uh the social atmosphere of it and stuff like that. And I liked making pizzas. Like, it was fun. So, mm. um, yeah, those kind of jobs were great, but uh. Um, yeah, being a table busser, that kind of sucked. Um, the shittiest job I think I ever had actually was I, I wanted to be a, I wanted to wash dishes at night. I wanted a night shift dishwasher job Yeah. and I got it at Sherry's. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. I can just go and escape into my little zone. Yeah. But the way that Sherry's is ran is they don't have bussers. So the, uh, dishwasher has to go out to the floor mm. to get it from a mid station from the waitress the, where the waitress puts them and bring them back in so you never get the opportunity to get into a zone mm. you know so I, I quit after a couple weeks yeah that was just like this sucks like I, I wanted to just like tune out and do my dishes but they were like 
Okay, now you got to clean the bathroom. Now you got to go get the dish. You know, it was just constantly like, I just almost got in my zone. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, and they just wouldn't let you get in your zone. And so finally I quit. But damn. Yeah. So, so remind me again, what year was that when you were living in the camper? Um, 2008. 2008. And, um, I, I lived in the, in vehicles for about 10 years. Whoa. Yeah. So it was about, five years ago that I stopped living in vehicles. Wow. Yeah. Really? So I did like a, yeah, maybe a little over a decade of living in vehicles and, um, in Seattle. Damn. I, um, have been focusing on in the past year or so are finding moments in my life that can keep me grounded right. because like this is one of the studios. It's definitely one of the smaller ones I'm part of. And as you can see, there's no, there's no windows or anything. So like I was, I've already been here since like 10 AM and by the time we leave, it'll be dark. You yeah. Know? So I haven't yeah. seen <laughs> daylight since this morning. You know what I mean? And, um, in the winter time, it just flies by right. and I'm like, what the heck? It's already spring. Right. You know? So, so I've been trying to find ways to like stay grounded when, when you were living in vehicles, do you ever, do you ever think back on that? Is that a place that keeps you grounded or? What helps you um, keep stay grounded in? I always enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, which I think a lot of people wouldn't, but like I just felt like um, I felt the adventure and liked it, you know. Um, and I've always I felt like I was camping. I didn't spend much time in the vehicle. I just used it. I kind of considered it a, like a sleeping pod, you know. Um, so I was always out and about all day. Um, and like my first painting studio would just a, was just like Gasworks Park. Mm. And they had like a covered area that they left the lights on. All yeah, night. yeah. And so I would just set up there at the picnic tables and paint, you know. And um, uh, they had running water. They had light, you know. You know, I was cold a lot, but like I was still just I had a place to make art. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of utilized the parks facilities for. Um, uh, you know, getting a, starting a fire, getting it warm. Um, yeah. Just setting up my easel and painting, hanging out with homeless people, mm -hmm. um, getting to know all of them. And then I was dumpster diving a lot for food. Um, and so I would, and I knew all the great dumpsters, man. And I would bring back these huge amounts of food and then I'd just cook these huge meals for all the homeless people in the park and we would just feast and then I'd paint and like, so that was like the first group of people that were really into my art was the homeless community. Wow. Yeah. And they, they knew me as, as a person better than any other artist or anything, you know, that was like my, um, the community of people that I was around. So, hmm. um, I still feel like a strong connection to the homeless community in Seattle. Um, you know, they were the first people believing in me. Um, wow. so, uh, I do like clothing and blanket drives every year. And, um, I try to get everybody that I can hooked up with something warmer and, you know, so my heart's really there cause I know what it's like, you know? Damn. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. I don't think yeah. anyone would have thought of that. Yeah. And that's, that's, but it's crazy. The thing is really not that far off if you want to be an artist full time like i think people assume you get one major music record hit you get put in an art gallery then you're set right no it it, it still it, takes so much time and it's such a grind yeah mm. yeah and i'm still working super hard man <laughs> like i mean um yeah this year i probably worked harder than any other year that mm. i've had so far as far as just like physical labor goes and all that, but you know, how do you relax? Um, well, I'm a pretty relaxed person. Mm. So I think that helps like just in general, like, like when I'm not working, I'm, and even when I am working, I'm, I, I have a relaxed disposition. And so I'm not really like super amped up kind of person. I think that just helps in general. And, um, painting studio painting, painting my canvases is super relaxing. So, um, uh, just hanging out and, you know, I'll have a friend come over and we'll just paint and hang out. Um, 
I go to movies. I walk my dog a lot. I go for hikes a lot. Um, uh, every year I go to like ocean shores in the winter and I get like mm. a hotel for like a week with a hot tub and just like super decompression, you know? Um, so I'm into like these kind of super decompression like situations where I'm like, I'm not working for three days and I'm not getting out of bed. Right. My dog's like, come on, we gotta go for a walk. I'm like, <laughs> really? All right. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. Would, would you say like, are you like, are you like the art guy in Seattle? Would you say like, do you think like do most artists know who you are and like, are like, Oh shit, I'm a huge fan. Or what is that like? I do get like, uh, a lot of people coming up to me wanting to talk to me and meet me. Um, when I go out hmm. and, I I like it, you know. I I feel like it's like this moment um for someone. They've seen my art for years and they're this is their moment to meet me and have an interaction with me. So whatever I have going on, I try to set it aside. Mm -hmm. You know, it could like maybe something bad happened in my day and someone comes up to me and I try to put me aside because this is their chance, right? Mm -hmm. Like and I'm putting out a lot of visual uh, work into the landscape. And so it's influencing a lot of people's daily lives. And so when they do have that chance, I want to give it to them because it's like, uh, it's important. Um, and I've, I've met people that are, uh, famous that have influenced me. And when they do give me that moment, it's like, I never forget it. Right. And I always hold them in high regard, you know? And, um, uh, but the most important thing is like, it's just humans having an interaction and I want to be there for it. And I want to like, um, be in the moment with them and be like, yeah, I do do those paintings and right. I'm really grateful that you like them and, you know, like have that interaction. Um, am I the art guy in Seattle? I, I probably have, well, I do have more murals than anybody up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I might be one of the most known names, you know, um, but I, the Seattle is a, just a huge community of artists yeah. still. So, um, I, it's, it's hard to say that, uh, if, or if not, I'm the art guy of Seattle. <laughs> like, Fair I, enough. I think it would piss a lot of people off if I said I was, right. um, but I do constantly put out work and um a lot of people like it and a lot of people don't like it so mm. it's um uh it's whatever <laughs> i don't know um it's it's just like for me it's about whatever i got going on next is what i'm interested in you know like it's kind of letting go of the past and being focused on the new work and being engaging in that so that's kind of where my mind and heart is is like uh, you're kind of only as good as the day you're in, you right. know? Do you think it's important to put like a face to an artist? Like, what do you think of artists like a Banksy or anything like that? I, I think it just depends. Hmm. It just depends on their, what they're doing, you know? Like for me, it, uh, it's the kind of person I am. So I think it's important to, be there as a face because I just I like people and want to meet them and I want to have that connection mm -hmm. um and I want to be present to people because I'm like I'm putting stuff out in the world and I want them to know who's doing it you right. know um and that's just me but I think like um I think bank what Banksy's doing and how he's doing it's super awesome too um I mean it allows him uh to really do what he wants which is like being in the ukraine doing a bunch of stuff and bringing awareness to that situation and he's more political and engaged that way mm -hmm. um than i am um he get, finds those hot spots and gets in them but like if everyone knew who he was he wouldn't be able to do it fair enough you know and so that kind of allows his like vein of magic to happen mm -hmm. by not being known and mine works a little better being known so um yeah, we're all just different people figuring it out, you right. know. Do you have goals to, like, have your art be similar to, marketing-wise, similar to Keith Haring? Like, he's, like, probably one of my favorite he's artists. He's one of my favorites, too. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's super awesome. Do you, like, do you like that, or what are your opinions that, like, 
you constantly see his stuff on like t-shirts or or, or whatever i like, think it's awesome you know like in a way i feel like i'm a graffiti artist in the sense that i want as many spots as i can get like mm-hmm. i want my art on as many d- zones or things that i can get them on and i i just think it's awesome like i think um the more the culture sees art and interacts with it, the better our chance for a better world is really like, Mm. I think art's pivotally important in the sense that it encourages imagination and um, inspires people's creativity. And that's, what's going to like, if anything's going to save the world, it's going to be imagination and creativity, you know, being able to envision something better than where we're at 100 percent. so like the more that's in the world the better whether it's t-shirts or hats or walls and paintings and and not just like one artist here and there but all all artists should have that kind of exposure Mm -hmm. you know is there like a app or a map that shows where all your stuff is throughout seattle I've never been good at that. <laughs> yeah. I There was one a while back that had a pretty good go at it. Um, but, I, but, you know, buildings get taken down and painted over things. And so it was kind of hard to keep up with. Mm. Um, but I'm, wor- I'm presently working on getting a new one up. So. Do you have a favorite location that you've done? Mirror. I guess that's. Did, how about this? Yeah. Favorite mural location and then maybe favorite like canvas location if there's like a certain house or area yeah um i you know it's always the one i always feel like it's my recent work that answers Mm. that question like the um redmond flat stick pub is probably my favorite like project i've done yet like it i really changed my painting style i i really went more expressionistic and um it's kind of got a van gogh feeling to it Mm. um so i changed up how i paint for it and just i think that experimentation and exploration is uh kind of is super important to me to like grow and and it's a really big risk to do it as a public artist you know because it's like i don't know if it's gonna look good and we're I'm just gonna go for it yeah it's like all right it's looking good thank god my idea is working you know um uh so it's this kind of constant like pushing myself to um be better and grow and i think that so whatever i just kind of finished is what i'm mostly would say would you know fair enough yeah and then what about like how many how common is it for your stuff to be on cars or is there only like a few maybe it could be that i'm seeing the same car or i i, I don't know <laughs> there's a few out there okay <laughs> yeah there's a handful um and i've done a ton but like so i can't remember what year it was um 2009 or something or sometime i i painted my own car i had a volvo car and i painted it and uh brought it back into town and a bunch of people wanted their cars painted. Mm. Um, but it was a bunch of people that had cars that were almost kind of at the end of their lifespan. Mm. And it was when I was less expensive. So it was like, I'll paint your car for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or something. Um, and I painted a ton of them. So there, if there was a while, there was a ton of them rolling around that were all like on their last legs. So like the junkyard or like the, um, the pull the pick and pull place was full of my stuff for a while (laughs) and people were getting like hoods that i painted and Ah. doors and bringing them home and hanging them up Ah. so there's some of that out there you know that's sick yeah they're just like oh my god there's a henry car and they just like remove the hood or whatever you know chunk of it and take it home um so there's a few of those hanging up and then uh now i mean people will have me paint their like brand new cars now wow so there's some that I have painted that are out there that are going to be out there for, you know, mm-hmm. 15, 20 years or whatever. But like, um, there's not as many. Right. Just because you start charging more and you get less, um, people can afford it. How'd you find your worth? Like, when did you realize how much you can charge and that it made sense and all that? 
Um, it first started out like more like calculating it like a contractor, like time and materials. Mm. Like it took me this much time to make this painting and it cost me this much in materials and how much do I need to like get more materials to make more art and be able to like get what I need in life. Um, and that those numbers were a lot lower than I think what other people thought they needed. Mm -hmm. Um, so my prices started out pretty low, but I was thinking pretty pragmatically and, um, wasn't being influenced by how other artists were pricing their stuff. I've never been influenced by that. I still don't. But, um, a few years back, I, I actually went to, um, a therapist about it because I just couldn't like, didn't feel like I was selling my stuff for what I deserved. And I, I had to do some like real work around that. And, um, yeah, have some big cries and, wow. you know, some stuff to like really go, okay, this is what my stuff's worth. And, and it's important to price it that way because I don't want to undervalue what other artists are doing to you. Like, you know, um, it's like you want, I, I want the ceiling to be higher so everyone can kind of go up. And if my prices are too low, then that ceiling drops and mm. doesn't allow other people to come up as much. So, um, becoming more conscious of, uh, the, the whole, all the artists in Seattle and how to like be in this ecosystem rather than this ego system, you know, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Oh, wow. So how, how often is it the city contracting you versus like an individual? I'd say it's all the city doesn't contract me. Oh, really? Yeah. It's all private. There's one that I did this summer that was uh, through the city down in Pioneer Square that they had to approve it and do mm. some stuff on this electrical box in Pioneer Square. That's the only one. Everything else has been private. Got Because what about, I think, he, you know Desmond Hansen? Mm -hmm. I had Desmond on like two years ago or something. Okay. Or maybe three years ago now. He was he, one of my first guests, like during so the pandemic. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's a cool dude. And it turned out like he was like childhood friends with my stepdad growing up. It yeah. was just nice. But maybe I got it wrong, but I thought he got contracted from the city to do the electrical boxes I or something. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I know he worked with the city on those. Yeah. So I guess muralists and artists, they there's just so many different routes to go down to different get things route. done. Yeah. Yep. Whoa, that's super interesting. And I just don't like, I mean, I hate doing paperwork and filling out forms and I just, mm. I mean, I probably could have made way more money if I, or could still, if I was into it, but I just don't like filling it, all the paperwork out. All right. Like I want someone to get a hold of me and want my artwork and want to pay me for it. Um, and I want that relationship. I don't want like, a, I don't usually do like, oh, there's this call to artists, come up with a design and maybe get chosen. I've done that enough times where it's like you put all this energy and work in and they don't choose you and you're like, right. you know, a waste of my time and energy. And I got enough people wanting my stuff to where I don't have to do that. And I'd rather take lower paid gigs and some big pimping half a million dollar city thing and have to compete and do all that for it because it's not the lifestyle I want to live, I guess. Fair enough. Yeah. And how often, like how long would it take I guess that really depends on the amount of space, but like on an average mural, how long would that take you to do? I'd say my average ones are two to three days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Then And how do you, do they like put tarps over it during the nighttime or how do you make sure nothing gets ruined or is that always like a well, risk? Well, it's just aerosol. So um, it's, uh, um, yeah, the weather doesn't affect it. Got it. Yeah. So that that's, yeah, it's, it's super cool because yesterday, I, that's so interesting that you said none of it's from the city. Cause I feel like some of them are like on just like walls that you feel would be part of. Do you ever, how about this? Do you ever do any for free that you just want to do? Not, not that someone's asking you to do. Do you ever just find a place you want to put something up and you put it up or. Yeah. So that's gotta be where I see some yeah, things. I do, or do no. that sometimes. Yeah. It could be. Okay. Yeah. There's some places that just need something. Okay. Um, and then I just do it. Uh, but. I, it's not as odd. It's not as, it gets less and less. Right. I'm so busy, but like, um, 
and there's times where I just need to go play and have fun mm. and not be in the mindset of making someone happy, you know? Fair enough. Um, and trying to, and I just want to paint. And, um, so I do that and I have, um, that's part of my life. Yeah. Too. So does anyone have any sculptures in their house or is that usually just no. plastic pub type thing? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just for flat stick pubs so far. Wow. Yeah. And how'd you get that? Like, how did that, so you have, a, you, you've had a few different collaborations so would, or what, what would you call that? I guess yeah, I, partnerships. I was doing, yeah. So I was doing, um, I did a couple places for flat stick pub and then they, uh, so I did like Pioneer Square and Kirkland and then they were like, we're going to open up this spot in South Lake Union. It's, um, we can't paint directly on the walls because it's a historic building mm. and, but we want your artwork in here. Can you do sculptures? And I was like, I don't know how to do what you need, but I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And like sweet. And so I figured it out and I actually hired a friend who had a good shop and, he helped me and we worked on that first set together and um, kind of learned how to do styrofoam sculpture and how to, um, and I've changed my method since that time quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I use different tools than he used and stuff. Um, trying to keep it a little less toxic. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's super like carving styrofoam with hot knives, puts <laughs> out a lot of smoke. So I'm just using an cha electric chainsaw now to kind of do it. Oh, which, wow. Yeah, it's uh, healthier for me anyway. But. Do you ever, do you still like geek out about certain supplies at all? Um, or do you kind of have your go-to thing at this point? I, I mean, I'm still learning and exploring. Got so yeah, it. this whole, the new ones I did, the, the first couple sets have kind of get beat up a little bit too much. So I'm like, um, I built them at the facility so that I could build them heavier mm -hmm. and I put a layer of cement on them. Um, and then plastic over that. So there's styrofoam cement and then a plastic coat. Um, and they are dense now. Like, mm. I mean, I didn't like experiment with beating them up, but I think they can take a beating now. Hell yeah. You know, and they're in a miniature golf place, so they have to be able to, you know, people are drinking beer and playing mini golf around these statues. <laughs> it's so it's by a golf They're going to take a swing every <laughs> yeah. once in a while, you know, you know. So, yeah, I think they're, I'm getting better at it, but. Hmm. And then how did you, how did this all lead to you getting like a, your own like art gallery? How did that come to happen? The art gallery, I just kind of like, put it out online um, uh, that I was looking for a spot and a friend of mine was like, Oh, I have this record shop and I'm moving out of it and I'm moving next door into a bigger spot. And so he talked to the landlord and they just kind of shooed me in there. Um, the landlord's really into the arts and stuff like that. So he wants to make the U district more art focused. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I just kind of got into that spot. And then now the record store, um, that's going to be kind of my work spot. And now I'm going to like take over half the record store and have my gallery Whoa. in there. So starting in January, I'll be, um, it'll be open like 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. So, and they're going to run the register. The Seattle Records is going to be, it's like a business partnership with them. And they're super cool. And they also own the, um, uh, poster shop, the Intervisions poster shop. Mm. So we're kind of collaborating space energy together and making like let's um, let's work together. So yeah. And are you ever going to like be there when people are there? Or how does I that probably work? will be setting up for like once a month art walks and stuff like that. Got it. You know, and um, and I'm in the neighborhood, so if just by chance, kind of thing. But it won't be. It was a by appointment gallery, and people got one on one time with me. But I just ended up, it was successful for about six months, and then I ran out of time to give people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just got too busy with murals and things like that and wasn't able to meet people and make appointments. And so I'm like, I got to change this thing up. And for artists who want to you know, pursue, pursue their art full time and make money, it, is there more, I guess it's probably a culmination of everything, but is there more money in selling individualized art or... Like, or selling to individuals or being in an art gallery? Um, I kind of feel like uh, you kind of have to do everything. Got it. Which is kind of a pain in the butt. But, like, 
the more ways you have to do things, the better off you are. Because certain times, like, things work really well for a while and then they stop working. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and that's just been the whole story of my career is like, <laughs> this thing's jamming. I got a situation and yeah. it's working. And then it's like, done. Mm. You know, um, no one's no one's buying out of there anymore or this thing isn't popular anymore. Um, and I've, uh, so I'm always switching it up. And um, when I started, it was more like I was kind of behind it. Like, oh, I didn't know that that's how it worked. And now I kind of know how that works. So I kind of stay ahead of it. Like I'm making changes before I need to. Right. Like knowing that no matter what I do, it's not going to be forever. Did you you ever get into the NFT space at all? Or what were your opinions on that? I haven't. Wow. I think I'd I'd set one NFT up kind of for fun. Um, My friend Andrew helped me with it. We're like, let's just set one up. So there's one out there that someone could buy. Hmm. Um, I don't even know what it's on. Um, but I just like, I haven't gotten into it. I, I kind of wanted to watch and see what happens. I know I look up to some artists that do do it, um, and do it really well, but I've also noticed some backlash with it for sure. Um, because people bought and then they lost a bunch of money. And so then they have this, I don't want anyone to buy my stuff and lose yeah. lose money what's going on know? with that that what are they called the the ape guy whatever yeah. that thing is board apes yacht like club or something yeah like if you buy an original from me like that thing's gonna go up in value mm-hmm. like i mean there's i was talking to another guy a guy the other night who was showing me this old painting that he had of mine and he was like i don't know the ethical way of selling this and i'm like i'll buy it <laughs> i'll buy that thing back from you for twice as much as you paid you know, cause I can sell it for four times as much as you paid, mm. you know, like, um, cause you bought it 10 years ago, like, um, f- like canvas work, fine artwork, murals, all that stuff goes up in value, you know? And, uh, so if you have a mural on your house, like there's, it's been a huge selling point for a lot of people's homes, you know? Wow. Yeah. The kids rooms painted up with something cool, oh, yeah. um, or their front of their house, like their retaining wall or something like that. Like that's always in the, like, um, the realtors like highlights or whatever, you know? So it's like, they're not losing money by getting a mural in their house. Mm -hmm. Like when they sell it, it's, I'd say nine times out of 10, it's a selling point. I have a good question for you. What's, what's it like being like a living artist and being able to like enjoy the fruits of your labor? Awesome. (laughs) It's cool. Like I just bought a new car. It's mm. the first time I bought a brand new car and I just bought it like a month ago now. Um, and it's uh, a little Subaru Crosstrek. And then I put, I modified it and I put about five grand into giving it a lift and putting bigger tires and bumpers and making it. So it's like all terrain and stuff. And I'm mm. looking at it going, I paid for this with my artwork, mm. you know, and that's a trip, you know, like, uh, and I really want that for everybody, you know, like, I want every artist to be able to get to that point where they are buying a brand new car and going, I did this with my, my artwork got me this, you know, or my music got me this, you know? Um, and that's like, uh, it's really like a satisfying feeling. Hell yeah. Two more questions. Mm -hmm. First, have you ever done like an album cover or anything? Like, do you ever work with like, like a recording artist or anything like that? Yeah. Um, I, I did like, I think four or five of the nomads covers oh wow yeah and um uh a few other bands yeah um and yeah i I think the nomads might be like the most known group that i've done stuff for hell yeah yeah and final question waiting for pearl jam to hit me oh that would be sick (laughs) come on eddie (laughs) let's do this thing yeah you're 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 dead like i'm telling you i I've got to be one of your biggest fans. I'm telling, I like Thanks. your 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 art always makes me so excited. And like, whenever I'm being a tour guide for a friend, I'm always like, oh, over there, that's Henry. Over there, that's Desmond Hansen. Like to see like my guests and friends see their artwork out in the city. It's it's it, it's it's what keeps me going and keeps me inspired. Honestly, that's awesome. um, so my final question for you is, what is um some advice that you would give to up and coming artists, creators, influencers. You've dropped a lot of gems, but yeah. if you have one final piece of advice, what would you say? Um, 
I guess if you really want to do it, you have to just keep it as your main obsession, you know, um, and don't let anything stop you from it. And literally anything like I've had some big things trying to stop me from it, like mm. big crises in my life that have um, where maybe it would have been a good idea to stop and get into something else. But um, I didn't. And I think that like um, just whatever you do, stick with it and put a lot of hours into it. And um, almost anything will work if you do that. <laughs> you know, I uh, I probably could have made more money if I would have put this much time and energy into like a lot of other things would have worked <laughs> better but like art's hard mm -hmm. you know and um but in the end i get to like um know that i did it uh how the old song or the old adage i got to do it my way so that uh um that feels good yes sir well i'm excited that you're now part of the nas community i appreciate it <laughs> yeah man. yeah this was really cool and you're really cool thank really, you yeah really thank you appreciate this chance i've been i've been looking forward to this and it, it just it's my favorite guests and the guests i always look forward to having on you just can't force it to happen i just happen to have a friend whose sister has painted with you before and That's now awesome. we're now we're here i'm like oh my it just something's just it just happened when they're meant to happen you know that's true that's so, the best things come out of that 100 percent way for sure well what is the easiest way for people to find your art and get a hold of you uh, the best way to find my art is drive around the city. <laughs> and the best way to get a hold of me is uh, um, uh, just look up Henry Murals and there'll be a trail. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. There'll be a way to find me if you if and, you put any effort in, though, you'll find me. I'm so Henry, happy. your, your, what is, it's not called your, what's, what's your, your signature, Henry? Yeah. Um, That's just your middle name or no? Yep, it's okay. my middle name. Yeah. Yep, and it's like a family name. I have great grandfathers, and uh, from both sides, kind of down through um, uncles and grandpas, and it's kind of this name that wow. I chose because it's kind of the center of my name, and it's the thing that kind of uh, from both sides of my um, lineage that match up. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, everyone, this has been the NAS podcast with, and then you say Henry. <laughs> and we did it. <laughs>